welcome back to another episode of the Language Lounge. My name is Michelle Ola, and today I am very excited to have Carolyn Schlegel and Aubrey Swisher here from. Tell me the name of your uh, collaboration website. How do you how do you say that? Is it just acquisition? It's acquisition. Okay, yeah. I wasn't sure it was like a C because it's your initials, or if it was just a cute, cute way to write acquisition. I just want to make sure I didn't say it wrong. So it was, just cute. It was kind of our signature: the A for Aubrey and C for Caroline. Yeah. And then our goal is I, acquisition for our students. I love it. I love it. Well, I am really excited to meet you both in person virtual and not um, through your tweets and through some of the, the other wonderful things you share. So that's wonderful to to see you in person. So thank you so much for coming today. So let's go ahead and and get started. So first of all, I do have to say shout out to both of you for, for being um, a current teacher of the year for Maryland, correct, Aubrey? Yes, I'm so excited to be representing Maryland, and um, I'm heading to Nashville soon, so fingers crossed. <laughs> Wonderful. And Carolyn, you are a past. So was it 2019 Maryland Teacher of the yes. Year, as well yes, as your school teacher, district teacher of the year, I think, right? Yes. Yep. 2019 uh, Maryland World Language Teacher of the Year, and then uh, 2021 uh, Washington County Public Schools Teacher of the Year. Well, congratulations. And it's not just about, um, it's not about bragging. It's about celebrating because I love seeing wonderful teachers like appreciated for what they are. So thank you so much. And, and congratulations to both of you on that. And you both just came back from Actful, correct? And you had a, a wonderful session I heard there. What, what, what did you present on at Actful? We called it Do It Right. And it was Authentic Grammar Acquisition. Awesome. And we're going to talk about your do, right? D-U-U. So that's exciting. I can't wait to, t to dig into that more. So, and I'll tell you, I love a good play on words, right? Or a good, a good pun in a, a session. So when I saw that, um, that was pretty awesome. So, well, let's get started because I would love to hear about um, both of you in, in, uh, individually, like what do you teach? Where do you teach? Kind of some of your experience in your context, um, but also just your wonderful collaboration. I love in your um, your uh, tagline for your website, it literally says Fab Collab in there in, in, your, in your web address. And I'm just like, I love that. I just love that. Uh, so Carolyn, do you want to go ahead and start? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Schlegel, and I am a Spanish teacher in Washington County Public Schools in the great state of Maryland. Uh, when I started my career, I was on the eastern shore of Maryland, um, and I spent nine years in Wicomico County um, in a school that was very diverse. Um, and when I came to Washington County, I'm in a school that is very rural. Um, so I have experience in both inner city style school um, for the first nine years of my career and now a much more um, quiet, rural, um, small town America style school. Um, and so I've been in Washington County for the past, gosh, I think this is year seven because this is year 16 of my career. I don't know where the time has gone. Honestly. That's crazy. Like, how am I in 16 years of teaching already? Um, but I tell you, in those 16 years, I've taught everything from level one to AP. Um, so when I came to Washington County, um, was at a PD experience and Aubrey was a teacher leader in Washington County. So I was able to connect with her there at some of the initial meetings that I had, um, as new teacher induction to Washington County, Maryland. I was like, okay, I see Aubrey. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can just tell who your people are right away, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I could tell who my people are. I would look, I tell you, we laugh about this all the time because I, I told myself, and I finally told Aubrey later in our relationship, you know, past like, after the point, <laughs> yeah, past the point of no return, right? I was like, listen, we were either going to be friends or we weren't going to get along at all. So. <laughs> We need to figure this out That's so great. That is so true. That is so true. So Aubrey, how about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. 
So I have taught my entire career at Washington County Public Schools. I moved from Pennsylvania um, to the Williamsport area, and I started out as a middle school Spanish teacher. So I had grades six through eight. I did that for two years, but my ultimate goal was always to end up in a high school. And even though I was having so much fun at the middle school, both my mentor teacher and my supervisor were like, hey, if you want to go to high school, you want to take this position that's opening up. I'm like, oh. But I'm having fun. And like, I'm telling you, this one's going to open and then close. So I scooted over after only two years of experience and started over again um, mm -hmm. at the high school level. And I've been there ever since at Boonesboro High School. It is Caroline's um, school's rival and very similar. Like we talk to each other every day on the phone during the work week on our commute. And for a part of our conversation, <laughs> we know whenever we're like rounding some of the farmland because we'll start to get choppy. <laughs> like, oh, you're at that spot. But yeah, we're very much teaching a, a similar um, audience, a similar group of kids. So that really helps us as well whenever we're planning together and to get our kids to collaborate or have a friendly rivalry in, in their projects. I love that. Well, that's very. Yes, oh, I can't believe it either. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's so great to have you both here, and and you already kind of um, alluded to your initial kind of connection, and you have similar contacts, and you know, working together. But one of the things when we were talking before we hit record is that we were talking about the, the pandemic. You said actually kind of accelerated your collaboration. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And I think that's might be the case. So I work with a lot of teachers, a lot of districts all over the country. And I feel like that happened to a lot of people. Maybe it was out of desperation, <laughs> out of loneliness. You know, there might have been a whole bunch of reasons of why um, we kind of came together. But, um, you know, I think there's something to that. So tell me a little bit more about how your real deep collaboration together and producing materials for language acquisition and cultural you know, competence, how that really kind of came, came together. I, I think first and foremost, I was super grateful for the amount of time that we were given by Washington County Public Schools mm -hmm. to be able to plan and prepare. Um, I know that it was a tremendous amount of work for teachers across the country in every level of every discipline to really convert their teaching almost on the fly, like in yeah. real, you know, building the plane while you're flying it. And, um, that I, I am always grateful for the fact that we were given the time that we needed to be able to do the job that we had before us. Um, and so from that time, we were able to, and the technology, because we didn't have Zoom, we didn't, I didn't use Zoom right. before the pandemic. It existed, but it wasn't a thing that I was like, oh, let me jump on a Zoom call. Right. Um, and Aubrey and I had worked previously together um, at different like district collaborative um, initiatives and curriculum workshops, professional development workshops. We worked in tandem with our supervisor, Paula Moore, who we put on professional development with her as teacher leaders for our county. And we knew that the two of us worked well together. We shared the same um, professional goals, the professional mindset, you know, we value efficiency, we value transparency. And that is something that we found in common and that has accelerated our ability to collaborate. But the pandemic, this like virtual world that existed that we got to harness during the pandemic really started our collaboration. Yeah, I think, um, I think the first time we started collaborating was 2018, and that was not on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Our supervisor, Paula, had made this wonderful day where she said, I will pay for a substitute, and you can spend the day at the board with other Spanish teachers throughout the county so that you can collaborate on some things. You know, oh my gosh, what a gift. But at that point, I didn't know Caroline very well. Um, and I didn't know her secret that she had already eyed me up and decided we were either going to be friends or right. <laughs> <laughs> I you had a choice. You didn't know it, but. <laughs> I arrived just to work. Didn't know who I was going to be working with. Um, Paula did an intro. We talked about the different levels we taught. And then I remember I had said um, I wanted to work on Honor Spanish 3. And 
then Caroline made her move and it was perfect. Like I'm so <laughs> happy that it happened. Um, she had just switched from, I think Western Heights middle school. Right. So I think honors three in Washington County was fairly new to her. And she came and sat next to me and she was like, Hey, I'd love to chat. And I saw this one lesson. Will you tell me, like, explain to me what you are looking for and what you do whenever you're planning. And I talked to Caroline and was showing her what I was doing. And then it became like talking to myself. Like it was, it was so exciting. Like she could just follow my train of thought. And then of course we, we are still individuals. So I'd say something, she'd say something be so complimentary. And we pumped out, I think like five days of plans very efficiently. And we were so happy with them. So of course that was something we wanted to continue, but pre pandemic, we didn't have that time built in, mm -hmm. you know, that day was really special and we would try to do some things on Google docs and we'd like, Hey, this is what I'm thinking for Spanish too. And we would do what we could and then fizzle off. But yes, 2020 came and it was crazy that we had that amount of time, but also Caroline and I ended up having very similar schedules. We were it teaching. Was really it was ironic that it was, like, it was like destiny almost. <laughs> was um, so yeah, it became a, a daily thing. And I think, did we have an hour every day or an hour and a half? It um, was like, yes, it, we had 30 minute, uh, our schedule changed like 897,000 <laughs> right. times. So, uh, but you know, we, I think we had at the end of the day, we had our planning periods were both at the end of the day. And then we had the short day where we had the additional time from our county to collaborate. So it was like a two hour block in the afternoon where we got on Zoom and had a shared Google Doc and we're like, let's do this. And we, and we both also thought, about like, how did it go with your classes and like, what kind of feedback did you get? And sometimes it was very similar or sometimes there'd be like something that was slightly off and we would go all the way back and figure out like, well, how did you present this? Or we're using the same stuff. What was different? And then that just, that really taught us that we needed to have that open communication because we just made each other better. So that's why we continued our, our conversation. So it's not just, um, I mean, we, we have all of our friend talk, but we also talk shop in the car. We make sure we reflect on like, so what'd you do? What went well? What are you thinking? Or like, oh, I just saw this online. This this is going on in this country. What can we do with it? And it's it's really a crazy, beautiful thing. Oh, I <laughs> it love is. it. Patrick Wallace, I remember he was, so Patrick Wallace from Georgia, um, Department of, of Education, and he was a guest speaker or a keynote speaker at MFLA, I think it was during the pandemic. Nonetheless, something he said has stuck with me um, from, and it makes me think of Aubrey, but he says, you have to partner and stretch. You have to find your person and find your group of teachers and then push yourself beyond your normal lesson planning and day to day. And so what I love about that particular statement is, and Aubrey just referred to it, it's not just planning or, you know, ideas or classes working with each other. We're talking second language acquisition. We're talking lesson plans. We're talking reflection. So this is, this is like a, a co everything. It's not just co planning. It's it's co the whole researching. Process. Yeah, it, co researching, co conversation, co plans, co reflection. Um, you know, and we make our own, as Aubrey said, formative assessments in the classroom and chat about well, wh how did you present that? What did you do? But those conversations are so beneficial to us as educators, period, not just language educators, but like the reflection piece is critical to advancing your own ability to do this job well. Um, and when we had that time, um, we really were able to harness that and, and discover that this is good for not just us, but it is good for kids. It is good mm -hmm. for students. And Perfect. that, and it's good for programs. Yeah. Um, A perfect transition because you know, it's like you said, it's one thing to collaborate and find that that professional support and that person you can kind of commiserate and celebrate and all of that with too. But um, but the things that your collaboration, the the you know, the work that your collaboration is coming out with 
frankly, is really fantastic. So, and, and I am a big believer that any ideas that one person has is magnified and can be so much better when you have other people, you know, involved in this process. Right. And like you said, I mean, pushing each other. Very cute, you know, like it's two people, isn't that how you get Google or the Apple products or the airplane? Exactly. Great music. <laughs> exactly. And so I do want to really talk about, um, what, you know, your, um, you know, your, how do I say it? I, we talked about it before and I was trying, it was not a framework, cycle, you know, your yeah. cycle teaching cycle. Yes. Yeah, so I'm like, I know it's not a framework, but, but your teaching cycle that you kind of, you know, from your experiences, from your lesson planning, it sounds like you've kind of put together some w beliefs of how, and some ways that you are, you know, following your teaching and learning with your students in a very deliberate, intentional practice sort of way. It's not just planning individual lessons or even individual units. So it's really planning that whole learning experience, that whole learning and teaching cycle um, that we, you, we, we kind of alluded to in the beginning with the do, <laughs> D-U-U, right? <laughs> and so I'd love to yeah. hear more about both this teaching and learning cycle, um, how that fits into your daily planning, what that is. I think this is something that is simple and impactful. Um, and I think teachers are going to be really interested if they haven't heard about this and heard how you kind of um, do your planning and, and do your teaching and your students do their learning. Um, so, well, those two adjectives that you used were exactly what we needed. And we thought were not only beneficial to ourselves, but that if we were sharing with anybody, um, our students gave us feedback during the virtual learning and the hybrid learning situations. And they needed more than ever patterns um, and they needed, they gave us feedback on what was working better and what wasn't. And they needed to have um, something tangible, but they liked how we did things before. So we had all of these conversations about, okay, if we're still going to give them these experiences and we want to end everything with some sort of opportunity to use the language in a real way, how are we going to really get them to not just you know, see some words in isolation, memorize them and be able to use it in a simple sentence frame. You know, we wanted them to be able to interact with um, native speakers or heritage speakers or maybe another language learner, but completely in the target language with confidence. And so in order for them to do that, they can't really borrow the language. They need to adopt it. So we were trying to find out how can we give the kids this experience where they're finding words that are relevant to this theme, they're relevant to this topic. And how can we make it so that they get to the point where they don't need to look at a sheet. They feel confident that they can either use this word or they've had so much exposure that even in English, right? You have something on the tip of your tongue and you're like, ah, oh. they're so used to using circumlocution as well with that term that they have option A and option B. So we decided, right? We wanted the kids to always be in the front seat. And so they had to discover. Do you want to talk about discover a little bit, Caroline? No, I can't. So we are very passionate um, about using actual score practices in our lessons. And so, you know, being mindful of backward design, being mindful of being intentional about opportunities for students to engage and interact in the interpersonal mode, um, making sure that our students are discovering language or have access to the language before they're asked to do anything with it. So we want our kids to, the first time that they see, I don't care if it's grammar, vocabulary, cult, all of it's embedded. I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. I want them to see it in a context that is real. And I want them to uh, make meaning. I want them to try and negotiate. Um, Bill M. Patton, right, his input processing theory. We talk a lot about this when we're having our conversations where he says, you know, immediately people will try, when you, when you hear information or take in information, you're immediately trying to do something with it in your brain and you can either make a connection and go forward or you make no connection and your brain dumps it and you've got nothing. So that was really powerful for us um, in making decisions on how we wanted to help students discover the language and then the process by which we scaffolded um, activities to help them access the language and make connections, whether they're new connections or connections to prior knowledge or 
um, you know, as Aubrey mentioned, circumlocution, like, oh, I've seen a word that looks like that before. It could potentially be a fam, a word family or a root word or something of that nature. Um, but in the discover process, we are um, helping students truly understand the language and identify the words in context. So if it's vocabulary, we want to give students an authentic resource and we want them to have the opportunity to interact with the text and find those words in the um, article or listen for the words in a video or whatever it may be. Um, look at them on an infographic. And we want them to be able to see them, recognize them, start to make meaning, draw some attention to them. Um, and then Aubrey and I start to provide scaffolds to help them understand the same piece with grammar, right? And so if it's grammar and context, we're looking for patterns here. If people are familiar with the PACE model, the idea of discover, understand, and use is, is not the same, but also similar to um, the PACE model where kids are looking at things, we're drawing attention to things, we're co-constructing meaning, and then we're using it um, to do things with it. And so when we talk about discovering language in context or grammar in context, it's through a cultural context. We're using authentic resources and we're drawing attention to the thing that we want kids to see and having them make meaning, right? I think planning the discover process um, might be the one that we spend the most time on uh, because we've practiced so much with coming up with the other activities, but it's so important that you're finding that cultural context, but in a, something that's going to speak to the students and it's going to hold their attention because you don't want it to be like, Ugh. <laughs> you know, you might have these kids. I have like my Spanish one kids, for example, for 90 minutes at the end of the day. So you need to find something good. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> be appealing to them to their age level it needs to be relevant to what's going into the going on in the world now um and so that's where we <laughs> we just send each other's uh texts or messages emails whatever we'll get sometimes messages with no other words but it's just a material <laughs> And we'll go, yes or no, or, oh my gosh, if we could only find like this thing to complement it, or I would love this, like in an infographic. Um, but we spark those ideas with each other. And once we get that piece, I feel like everything else kind of falls into place. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the easiest steps, I think, that you could start collaborating with somebody new. You know, you might not have a similar style at first setting up activities, but what language teacher doesn't want to use authentic materials? Right. And we have all of these global themes that we can address in our classes. So that's really an easy way to start is like, you know, I have this great resource or I saw this. I'd love to do something any ideas and you can do that within your county within your building or even on twitter with that link chat community sure. i mean there's there's so much opportunity but after right. we have the discovery piece in place as caroline mentioned we need the students to actually understand so discovering they're interpreting they're negotiating some meaning to get you know what's what's happening what's the whole picture here how are all of these things related what do you think we're going to be discussing but then the understand piece we're going to break it down a little bit so that they can focus on either a grammatical construct and how is it being used um, what must that mean what what would that be trying to express or with the vocabulary trying to figure out what that term um, what's another synonym or another way of saying that and so Often we use, you know, for vocabulary, um, kind of a matching thing. We want the students to, to have a word and associate it with an image. Um, we want them to be able to associate it with more language. And if we are matching up definitions or something like that, we'll make sure we're using another authentic resource and get some um, definitions offline and have them do this together where they're matching so that they're speaking about it. They're talking about it. The upper levels um, are at a point where they can really do it without much scaffolding because we have practiced our reading and listening strategies so much and focusing on what you know and what you do understand. And I think they're a little bit more comfortable taking the risk. You know, if I'm wrong, it's all right. We'll, we'll get this cleared up. Um, but the lower levels, you know, put those, those images in there, you can still have the definition, but if it's using 
um, something that they've never heard before, you can put a little emoji in there or something and the visual will still help them as it most often would in life. You know, we, we don't go through life with our eyes closed. So having an, an image to accompany language, that's a natural thing that, that students are going to run into. Yeah. I think too, that we have developed now that we, when we do the understand phase, right? We have so many times done, like we have templates. Do you know what I mean? So like, maybe we want them to do a pictogram. Maybe we want them to see these words in context in the discover phase and they've highlighted the words in context. Now we've given them a series of, okay, well, we'll use reverso dictionary, find some definitions in Spanish that are authentic. And we're having them pair based on using the context the definition from the real dictionary, right? And so now they're negotiating meaning and trying to use the context plus the definition to see if they can pair these things. And so it just allows, we're really focusing on like the metacognitive process here mm -hmm. and wanting students, to, we wanna see the process of learning and we want the students to go through the process of learning so that they can feel empowered when they acquire this language. And as Aubrey said, we don't want them to just use it. We want them to adopt it. We want it to become their own. So, you know, we use the stamp examination in, um, uh, Washington County Public Schools for, to, for students to earn the seal of biliteracy, right? We want students to understand their proficiency scale. We want students to, to know that if you don't understand everything, that's okay because you're on a, you're on a path and eventually mm -hmm. you will. And I think that's one of the, the things I love most about working with Aubrey in this discover, understand, and use process is that it's um, asset-based where students are asked to demonstrate their knowledge and their transfer of knowledge so that they can just show what they can do. That's mm -hmm. it, right? And and we help them along the way. We guide them along the way. We coach them along the way. Um, and it allows for a much, um, um, oh, the word I'm looking for, goodness gracious. Uh, it lowers the effective, that's what it is. <laughs> oh, the educational terms, right? It lowers the effective filter when kids are feeling like they can do this and it's no yeah. risk for them because it's just a process. I think that's huge um, that students feel confident. I mean, you, I'm sure you've been in a language class yourself or maybe you've been that student who... Uh, you might be able to get everything perfect or say everything perfect, but you don't have that confidence and you don't put it out there. So mm -hmm. if your teacher's asking a question, right, it could be as simple as that. You're not raising your hand and offering up this great response that you have because you're in your head going over it and like, is that right? I'm not sure if that's an irregular verb. So I don't know if I have that conjugate. Like, oh, that's not what we're about, right? We want to make it... <laughs> Like we want the students to feel confident and to focus on being comprehensible. So we're giving them all the little steps along the way so that they're always seeing that language in the same context that they're using it. So I think that repeated exposure in both the discover and the understand phases help to build that confidence. And just the way that we have the students often grouped together during those stages. And then we play lots of games, you know, whether it's things that we do in our classroom with manipulatives, or if we're doing one of those electronic games, you know, you see it so much, um, you use it so much, you speak it. And so you can put it out there without that fear of, oh, am I not going to have this right? Or if, you know, the one day my Spanish four students came in and we thought we were going to have a conversation um, with a woman from Argentina the next week, but something came up in her schedule and she said, um, I am free tomorrow. She told me that, you know, around 9 p.m. the night before. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's their first time in Spanish four, you know, this semester with them having this experience. I mean, this was in September. Wow. They came in. And I greeted them and I said, okay, in five minutes, guess what? <laughs> they were like, Senora, why does this look like hybrid learn? Like, why do you <laughs> what is this? Like, okay, oh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a guest. And they're like, yeah, next week. And I was like, no, no, five minutes. Like, what? Yeah, she's from Argentina. It's gonna be super exciting. And, you know, some of them were already excited and they were like, wait, what now? And I said, yeah. And like, what, 
oh, what are we going to do? And I said, well, first of all, she knows that you're a language learner and we're just going to have a conversation with her. So I'd love for you to think of, you know, what's the question that you want to ask her? And then we're going to talk about what you've been learning. We were talking about El Asado. So, you know, you know tons of stuff about that in the language part. Just you know, say mm-hmm. what you want to say. Every single student spoke. And she understood what they were saying. You know, somebody that didn't speak up, she had them repeat and they were able to repeat it. She had a question and then they said it another way. And I almost cried. (laughs) Beautiful. Beautiful. That's what we are trying to do to make it so that they are Yes, confident enough, not just to talk to each other in the classroom. Not to have a one-on-one conversation with me, but to be able to go beyond their school community and interact with somebody, have a true unscripted conversation in the target language. I mean, that just, it's everything to me to see that they could do that. But I think confidence is the key. That's awesome. And that's, that's through them understanding it, right? And not Mm -hmm. just repeating it, not just memorizing Mm -hmm. it, not just, you know, having it in a certain context. So I love how that flows, you know, how that all flows into your last you, right? Of the yeah. using it, right? So tell me more right. about what are the experiences then after, you know, they've discovered this language, they've made it their own, they've processed it, they've really had so much exposure to it, they've used it, you know, they've played with it, they've done games with it, they've done all of the stuff, they've seen real world right. things. And then what do they do? What are some things that they do in that last stage? So with the use phase, this is the most exciting part for us, Mm -hmm. right? And I will say, I think that it's important to mention, like, sometimes in the use phase, we realize that we need to go back. So this isn't just like we do discover, we do understand, and then we do use. It doesn't always go that way, right? So we get to the use phase and kids are like not performing, you know, they're, they're writing, you know, maybe an email response to someone, right? And I look at the use and I'm like, Oh, nope. We need to go back to understand for a hot second um, <laughs> and address some of the things that are going on here. But um, one of our favorites in the use phase, we have lots of them. I mean, you can write. We focus on all of the modes of communication. Um, we want to make sure that we are um, being AP minded because we do have AP programs in our schools. So we want to make sure, you know, we want our students to be able to perform cultural comparisons. We want our students to be able to uh, write emails, both formally and informally. We want students to be able to form arguments, argumentative essays. Um, We want students to be able to converse with each other, right? And so Aubrey just mentioned one of the ways that we use language is connecting with guest speakers Mm -hmm. that are international. Um, And Akash Patel, who is now the president-elect uh, actual he's president okay. now right yeah because yes yes um president it's a okay it's yeah, a big deal. Yeah, he's a- <laughs> no matter what his title is a great person a great yeah. language advocate <laughs> yeah and so connecting with happy world foundation our kids have had access to conversations that on a global scale um, and it's fascinating to watch students be able to, as Aubrey said, they were talking about el asado and what that looked like. And, you know, the lady was able to share with them what it looked like, what it was, what it meant culturally, what it meant for her family. And so then that prompts our students to be able to then use it again to make cultural comparisons. Well, what is that? Mm-hmm. How does that compare to what we have here in the United States or in your family? Um, we have, we do have students write, you know, show me if you can use this language in context. Um, tell me a little bit about whatever it is we're studying. Um, the, one of the quizzes that we give our kids that actually I'm, this quiz has been, it's so helpful. Um, we put the words that they discovered from whatever format it was that they discovered. Um, and let's say there are 15, they need to pick depending on the level eight to 10 words um, mm-hmm. and they need to use them correctly in context where we're looking at proficiency level in their writing. And so the words are on the left. I don't care which ones you pick, mm-hmm. pick the ones that you have adopted, pick the ones that you feel confident with and use them in context, in a sentence, but demonstrate your proficiency. How can you level up? What can you connect? How can you show me that at level 
five, you are at an intermediate high phase. What is intermediate? Our kids know those terms. They know what it looks like to be speakers, writers, um, and interpreters at that level. They're able to do things because they, they can see their markers and they want they want to go mm -hmm. forward, right? Um, what are other ways we use it, Aubrey? Oh, well, I was even thinking about games. Sometimes that's how they demonstrate it. Um, mm -hmm. It's not the deepest form, but that's where you can see if the kids can use it. So I know mm -hmm. there's one game that I like to play in my classroom and just called Ojos y Orejas. And so oh, yeah. there are all the students uh, separate into two teams and the teams are lined up. So the back is to the board. And then there, sometimes I rotate the speakers depending on the level and the situation, or if it's at the beginning, like in my Spanish ones, instead of making every student do it the first time, I had volunteers that were like, who thinks they can describe language? And then we had probably three volunteers on each team and they would rotate, but you have the eyes. So those are the people that are like the first captain of each team that can see the board and I project a word and they're not allowed, their hands are behind their back. <laughs> You're not using gestures. You cannot use English. You must use Spanish and you want to get your team, only the person right in front of you to say the word, the correct word. And so that's them, they're practicing the circumlocution. Um, and it's wonderful that they can use so much language and the other students can understand them. That's a big deal. If you can get somebody to listen to your description and, oh my gosh, first or second guess, know exactly what you're talking about, you're comprehensible. You've got that ability to communicate in this context, in this theme with this, with these words. Um, and then there's other things that we'll do, like the fishbowl with the different rounds. And they'll do some sometimes where they're trying to use the word in a sentence and somebody has to pick it out or um, something similar where they're using circumlocution. Um, there's just... Games, they're, they're a possibility, but we also love the choice board. Mm -hmm. That is fun for the use phase. And um, that will often include some sort of creation, but the students have choice. And we also try to um, include ways for the students to participate in the culture. In some Experiential way. learning, for sure, yeah. is a huge part of the choice boards that we create in our use phase. Absolutely. Um, speaking of experience, I'm just, this popped into my brain yesterday, <laughs> um, our spit. So I have Spanish five first period. It's my AP class and my colleague, uh, Lisa Miller, she has, um, Spanish two during that time. And we have yesterday was Dia de Reyes. So, you know, we're chatting about what that is in my AP class at a much different level. Right. But she's also chatted about it in her level two class. And so yesterday we brought our students together for um, Café, Comida y Conversación. And so we had, I have 10 level five students and she had, I don't know, 20 level uh, two students. And I put two students of mine in each of her five groups and they were given topical questions um, or could just have conversations about however it went, right? So my students were using the language to share with them about the other days and what they've learned um, and to reflect on their previous year, 2022, looking forward in the new year. And Senora Miller prepared questions that students passed around to keep the conversation going. And so again, the co-planning piece there, making sure that you provide opportunities for your students to use the language that they have learned through the context of your classroom, the context, you know, all of it. It's just, that was a big thing in, in, during the pandemic, because Aubrey and I had similar schedules, we were able to align our classes so that mm -hmm. we could have debates yes. um, and use the language for a debate on a topic. Um, we just recently looked at the FIFA World Cup um, with lesson planning for FIFA World Cup, looking at the controversies that exist around the World Cup being in Qatar, looking at human rights, um, and students are writing argumentative essays after exploring all of this information and this discover and understand phase. And I just looked at the essays yesterday and I was 
blown away, not just by the language. The language needs help in the places as language learning does. The humans that we are creating from sharing the world with them in our classes, it's a humanities course, right? We yeah, they're so aware. Right. We want our students to be global citizens. We want them to understand the world, its people, how to connect. Um, and when you read, whether the language is perfect or whether the language needs, you know, whether it's novice mid or advanced low, I don't care. Your message is that you understand more about the world now than you did before you came into my class. And that is important to me. Um, what Caroline was talking about with them being so aware of, of current issues, that's also a fun thing that students can do to use their language is to make PSAs, like the public service announcements. Mm -hmm. And you can actually use them. You know, you can create awareness or have a campaign for something. I know my Spanish National Honor Society is very interested in outreach. So they will also, you know, come up with little campaigns or commercials that they want to be broadcast in the mornings to their peers. And so we can do that in a bilingual way now, which is beautiful. And it's very cool to see what your peers can be doing in the language. Um, another thing that I can't believe you didn't bring up, Caroline, because this was your baby. You started this one, was the book cafe. Oh, oh my gosh, that was, it was amazing. I don't know. I mean, I'm excited about it, but as I said, she started this. Do you want yeah. to tell them about it? Yeah, I can do that. So <laughs> our school, our, our school's um, value collaborative planning, our, our district is very big on um, collaborative planning. And so one of the things that I've been able to do um, is I have a built-in opportunity during my school day to connect with other teachers. So I've worked with our um, carpentry teacher um, and we took my level five AP classes down and we looked at how they cut metal. And in my classes, right, we studied this through the lens of artistry like local artisans versus machines essentially and technology and the impact of technology um on local artisans and communities um and so like that was a cool opportunity the one that aubrey's referencing is i've partnered with our uh, media specialist jane yoder she's she's she was a an amazing english teacher and is now our media specialist and so i was like listen i've seen you do these like she calls it book tasting, right? And the kids come into the media center and she's got different books set up and, you know, the kids look at them and she has this menu that they fill out. And I'm like, I want to do this. Like, how can we do this? What do we need to do? And it's coming up on Hispanic Heritage Month. And so I'm like, oh, let's do authors of Hispanic or Latino heritage. This is exactly what I'm going to do. She's like, oh, I love that idea. So she gets all the books from all the schools and all the places and sets up this beautiful cafe, right? And I have students go in, they're discovering um, different artists, their backgrounds, why they're writing, um, where they came from, all of this stuff, they're writing a biography about them. Um, then they went into... Um, writing a hook for the book. So we had a display of hooks um, in our school for a literacy program. We're very big. Our school and Spanish. Yeah, yeah. Our school's focus is is literacy. We want to improve our, our students' literacy to make sure they're, what is it, 1185 is a Lexile score that they need for to be college and career ready. So we are very focused on making sure that we are scaffolding learning for students and reading across the content areas. So I'm like, listen, we're going to add some Spanish stuff to this bulletin mm -hmm. board, guys. <laughs> Not only do we have Spanish speakers in our school and EL students who will benefit from this and know that there are books in our library mm -hmm. that they can use and read and enjoy. Um, so we did the hooks and then we did book posters so that she displayed the book posters after all of their research uh, in the library next to the books if the book posters were in Spanish. And then they also had to, the, the final piece of all of this was that they had to imagine that their book won an award for, um, and they had to pick the, the award and it was from the Latino, oh, I can't remember the name of, of the, the I book. I really feel like it was like Latin American Book Awards. Book I really feel like that. it was that simple. <laughs> um, but they had to read, I found the online program for Latin American Book Awards, right? And so I read, where would your book fall? 
right? So they're reading all of this stuff. They find where their book would fall. And then they have to present their book as if it won and why to the class, right? And so not only have we read and interpreted, not only have we written and shared biographical basic information and, and where are you from and you know what is your name and why are you writing, but we have now done a little bit of an argumentative piece, persuasive writing, like why this book is getting this award. We have connected to our community. We have provided access to books that students didn't maybe know that existed. Um, and so this was this was something that presentation. Yeah, mm -hmm. present, yes, all of the modes of communication are there, right? And so when we talk about collaboration, like Aubrey and I collaborate so well together. We are efficient, we are quick, but our collaboration has taught us that we can reach out and collaborate with others as well. And the process of collaboration that we have developed with each other has streamlined how I collaborate with others. Mm -hmm. So I know I know my process, what I need to do on my end to be a better colleague to others in the collaborative process. But that was such a project I really enjoyed. Um, the background information was that it was for an AP class and we were studying personal and public identity. So the students had already discovered some language related to that. And like, what a relevant yeah. <laughs> way for them to show that they understand that language, they're reading things, they're, they're reading biographical information where some of those terms will be, or they'll need to use the terminology that they've studied to be able to talk about this person. And then they're, they're diving into a book. They had to read a few pages or they could do more, but they needed to understand what the book was about, find themes. And so it was really a, an authentic learning experience for them. Um, that added not only to, to their own learning, but to the culture of the entire school. So I just thought it, it was very impactful. And again, the students really felt like they were doing something. It was a learning opportunity and an experience. It wasn't, you know, a worksheet followed by um, a simulated conversation and a vocabulary quiz. You know, there was a little more to it that it didn't feel artificial. It really felt like they were doing something relevant um, and purposeful. Yeah. yeah. I love that. So there's one thing I wanted to touch on that you, I don't know, I think Carolyn, you mentioned, and I wanted to dig into this really briefly. And that is the difference between sharing and collaborating. Because mm. I think sometimes we sh teachers share a lot, but how is it, how can we, maybe just how can we move? What would you tell teachers of how we can move past sharing a resource, um, sharing some really good idea and finding somebody to collaborate and really get, you know, dig into the heart of what you do with that, right? How students are going to discover that. How are they going to, um, you know, how are they going to understand it? How are they going to use it? Um, do you have any suggestions, thoughts on, on that kind of aspect of collaboration? Because sometimes we think collaboration is just sharing stuff yeah, with other right. teachers, right? And so it, I think, you know, so let me, hear, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Do you want to go well, ahead, Aubrey? Sure. I think um, the difference between sharing and collaboration is that reciprocity. And I do think that there is a level of vulnerability that you have to have. Um, you know, whenever Caroline first started working with me on that day in November, what was that, 2018, mm -hmm. whenever I was talking, I was open to her suggestions as well. I wasn't like, this is my lesson and this is it. You know, when she's, oh my gosh, I love this. You know, I did this activity before and they're like, oh my gosh, how can we tweak this? You have to be willing to adjust and not take things as a criticism. Um, and I think that can be hard because some of us are really, we feel like we own our things. I think that happens, especially if you work in isolation a lot. And if you're somebody that's like, well, you know what? I don't, I don't lean on a textbook. So then you feel like I made this, this is mine. Um, but it's the, the same things that you preach with your kids. I think you have to practice. So I know we are, really in tune with feedback and feed forward. So we like to reflect and have our students reflect on the work that was done, look at the task, and what could you do to level up? And is there something that I could do to help you get there? Or is there something that you could do? But we very much talk to each other like that too. So um, we got to do that in real time. 
uh, before when we had that nice chunk of time, but now we don't. So we will send something and you have to be able to say, I really like this. I think we could make it better if, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just that open conversation. I do really think it's the, the vulnerability and both people taking that risk, just like our language learners, where you have to put yourself out there using the language here, you have to put yourself out there with your, with your craft and your vision. So you need to have that conversation and be open to learning. You know, I think it would be uh, great to do this. So I was planning on doing this. You have to be ready for somebody to say, that's great. Or for somebody to say, well, I don't think the students would be ready for that yet. What if we did this? And that's why we love Google Docs, because it is easy to jump in on that doc. And so if Caroline is on the document the same time I am, and she's typing, 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 and this thing looks beautiful, I don't delete it. But if I have that thought and I'm like, wait, Caroline, like this is great, but they need something before this. Before this. Well, I just moved my cursor there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Caroline's like, oh, here she comes. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I love about that, though, is we are augmenting each other's life. Like it's our, it, you know, it's an augmented lesson. So I think mm -hmm. the difference between sharing like here I made this you can use it if you want to you know and then the person uses it and great it might have went well it might have not gone well whatever like sharing is just giving something and Aubrey mentioned the reciprocity piece I think a collabor a true collaboration right you need to discuss your purpose your goals what you want students to be able to do a true collaboration is a backwards design right we want it what, what do we want students to be able to do then we have to have that conversation and we have to truly co-develop you know i might have something that i can share and you might say okay i like this so even if it is a document that i have the conversation that comes before you share it and the conversation that comes after you share it changes it from sharing to collaboration it doesn't have to be both of you creating the document at the same time. Mm -hmm. Collaboration doesn't have to be everybody, you know, typing on a Google Doc or, you know, I'll do this half and you do that half because that's not collaboration. You know what I mean? Like you need to, the that's conversation really piece, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the conversation piece, whether, you know, Aubrey hands me for the, the sake of this, a worksheet. Here, I made this. This is great. Go ahead and use it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, Aubrey doesn't give me a worksheet, but you know what I mean? Like this great activity. Let me just say activity on paper, right? This great there activity, you go, an activity on, on paper. paper. I like that. <laughs> right? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to use this. And then Aubrey and I never talk about it at all, ever. That is not collaboration. That's sharing. Um, if I say, hey, Aubrey, listen, I'm having trouble with, X, Y, and Z, and I'd really like you to help me. How do you approach this? Do you have anything that I could use? Then I take it, I use it. And then I go back to her and say, hey, listen, that really was helpful or that didn't really work for me. How? I, here's what I did. Here's some of the adjustments. Do you have any ideas on how we can move forward? So I think that's the, the biggest piece for me is the, the conversation. Yeah, and I, I agree 100%. And one of the things that I think the pandemic did was brought out a lot of sharing. Everybody was sharing all of their things. And now I think I would love to see additional collaboration around all of that sharing, right? Because that's where it just keeps getting better and better and better, right? So the more you kind of collaborate and build and extend and and do all of that stuff, I think that just even just brings, you know, brings the level up. I think it's healthier and it also adds to teacher confidence too. Um, mm -hmm. If you can really find a way to collaborate with somebody and it, it takes some guts, you know, to have that initial conversation, but I think it's wonderful. And, you know, having multiple perspectives, looking at something and, you have uh, different kids. I told you that Caroline and I teach in similar schools, but they're still different. And we don't want our resources to only apply to somebody in a small rural town. Like we want, <laughs> we want it to apply to everybody. So we have our own personal backgrounds. We have our school backgrounds and we can put that all together. And that's pretty diverse in the end. And so we can consider all of those components and maybe bring somebody else in. Um, it's just the conversations are richer and it's not as 
a streamline. You know, it's not just one size fits all because it's not. And I think that has really making adjustments, um, whether it's in real time, we've done that, mm -hmm. <laughs> or after the fact, um, you can grow a lot through your, your collaboration. You've got self-reflection. You have somebody else telling you um, what's great or what we might be able to change or have you ever thought of this? What if we tried this instead? Uh, and it's, it's just a richer experience for your students too. And as a teacher, I think it's great to not feel like you're in something alone. Um, and if you're collaborating, if you're having those conversations, you do have a teammate and you feel like you're part of something just a little bit bigger, you know, not just going into your one classroom and closing the door and you have your little workspace or after school, if you bring your laptop home and it's just like you by yourself <laughs> with the TV, you know, it's nice to have, yeah. have somebody else, um, to support you. And I do think that's the difference, um, sharing. If you're somebody that shares all the time, sometimes that can even feel lonely. Even if you see people. It can be draining, right? And, yes. and it's giving all of your energy all, you know, when you're yes. give, constantly being the one that's giving everything as well and not getting that, yes. that, that back. That can be a wow. you, know, you get that affirmation from somebody else too. Um, and then whenever, you know, you can't give 110%, you know, when you're starting to feel a little bit drained, somebody else can pick you up. Mm -hmm. um, which is, it's great. And it, it, it helps okay. with your work life balance. Um, same thing. I don't think you want to be stuck on the receiving end. It might seem great, but, but you're like, Oh my gosh, I found all these people that share all these things. I don't have to do anything. Well, what happens when that person gets burnt <laughs> out? You, know? you don't want to feel like you're relying on, on somebody else. It's the same thing with our learning cycle. Help. We want the students to adopt the language um, if there's teachers using our, our things that we put out there, we really hope they are, but we hope that they're also making some of their own things and adopting right. some of the activities or the styles that we're using to help them in their, their own preparation or their own collaboration. Um, it's just a lot of times we put out our lesson, like we, we put out lesson plans in different varieties. Sometimes it's like a teacher, you know, how to, and sometimes it's a true lesson plan. You can really see with the true lesson plan, with our standards and our alignment, the process that like what we want students to be able to do, the unit's goal. And, and that piece is, is really powerful, the purposeful piece. But we hope that seeing that in writing, the collaboration that people are exactly as Aubrey said, able to take that and say, you know what, I actually think I could do something similar to this. Oh, they used a pictogram for that. I could augment student learning by adding pictures to a document that I already have that I'm going to give to kids to help scaffold their learning. So it's not about necessarily just sharing things. It's about sharing ideas that spark, mm -hmm. spark. <laughs> right. other things for other people. Um, I love that. We have students, one of the things I wanted to mention that I was trying to keep in my brain while you were talking, Aubrey, was that we also have students share with us um, resources, right? So students Wonderful. get, because they know we use all kinds of stuff and we find online articles and we're using Twitter and whatever, whatever. And we will have students come to us and say, Senora, I found this article and it is awesome. And so we look at it and Aubrey had this just recently happened with the FIFA lesson plans that we had made up. Beautiful. I have all these soccer players this year. <laughs> oh, that's great. And so yeah, and I have a student. Here's the like, thing. Can you please make a lesson. Yeah. We make a lesson out of the thing that the student suggested to us. And how does how that validates not only the kid, but he's like, well, this is the article, right? And yeah, I said, I said, what are you thinking? I can try, but what are you thinking? And he told me what he was envisioning. And That's I said, awesome. mm, do you think there's a resource out there? And he found it. Like at lunchtime, I come back from lunch and he's like, Senora, I got it. Here it is. <laughs> That's so Fast great. Forward, right? It's the, Caroline and I are on our way to Axel and we started planning on the train. <laughs> on the train. That's where that was produced. But I mean, I love it. My students were so excited when we came back and to see that individual student, like, oh my gosh. And somebody else, like, is this what you gave her? Like, there it is. We're doing it. And that's really great to have that student voice in there too. And I love that you kind of brought up, we don't just collaborate with each other. We're collaborating with our students. Like That's they have awesome. some staying here. They're, they're mini authors as well. 
I just I love think- that. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love everything about that. So I have one more question for you guys before we wrap it up. And that is, like you said, collaboration in a lot of ways as involves vulnerability because you have to have another partner, right? So how do you put yourself out there? What, do, what would you recommend to a teacher that wants to collaborate and doesn't really know where to start or who to tap or how to go about this to, to find, you know, that, that kind of resource or that person to start that process, or maybe where should they start? Where would you recommend they start? I, one of the things, and I'm so glad that you said this because it reminded me of something I wanted to say. I think forced collaboration is really difficult. I think a lot of times we're put in places as teachers where, you know, oh, it's time for, you know, you to go collaborate with so-and-so or you go collaborate with so-and-so. And And sometimes that's productive for people and sometimes it is counterproductive for people. And so it's really important to recognize that just like our students, teachers are diverse. We have ways we like to do things. Um, We are different types of learners and leaders. Um, And so you have to make the most of all of your situations, but you need to find somebody. Putting yourself out there is a little bit hard, but you have to be involved in your world language department to know who the types of people are that could potentially be like you. And if you are not, we have opportunities in our county and I, you know, in the counties that I've worked in here in Maryland, there have always been opportunities to attend curriculum writing, Mm -hmm. uh, attend summer workshops, um, jump in on, you know, different professional development opportunities, even if it's just you sitting and, and being in the professional development, not Mm -hmm. leading it, but you can look at, at people, know, learn what they teach and read people to see like, okay, I would work well with this person. They teach the same thing as me, or maybe they teach a level above me, but I want to start bouncing ideas off Mm -hmm. of them or potentially just trying to engage in a professional collegial relationship that allows me to start to develop this collaboration, right? So I would say you have to be involved in your department first to be able to get a read on who would be the person for you. And if you are not involved in your department, your local language associations Um, In Maryland, we have the Maryland Foreign Language Association. Your state associations are great places to network and collaborate with other teachers. Um, And then NECTFL and ACTFL. Now, I realize that things cost money and not all school systems provide support for that. Um, But those are opportunities. There are free professional development opportunities on Twitter. The internet and pandemic teaching has made it so easy for us to connect, we learned to harness the power of technology to reinvent what it looks like to collaborate, right? We're all sitting, you're in Florida. Right, Aubrey, yeah, no, this Florida. wouldn't have happened, I don't think. I wouldn't no. have done this, you know, so. And I'm on the eastern shore of Maryland. Like, we are not anywhere near each other right oh, now. Yeah. I'm in West Virginia. <laughs> yeah, and I'm over by the beach. Right. I'm looking out the window at a beautiful river right now. Like it's <laughs> like no. we're not anywhere near each other. But I think when you learn people and you learn it, it's it's all about interpersonal relations. It's all about relationships. That's the core of literally all the things is relationships and communication. So con- connecting, putting yourself out there. You have to have the guts to connect. That's the main point. And I think you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes you just have to take that chance, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it was me sitting next to, to Aubrey, you know, like, okay, well, I, I don't know if you remember that, but I didn't know if that was like a, a one and done. <laughs> like we had that session, but Caroline was, she was so open and I just worked beside her. So I knew that she knew her stuff. I didn't know if she really needed help or not, but she sent me something that she was going to do. And she said, Hey, you know, I'm just, I haven't been using the imperfect and preterite, you know, to teach students recently because I've been doing middle school. Would you mind looking at this and giving me any feedback? And you're like, Oh my gosh. Like she didn't ask me for anything more than just to look at her language, but you're like, holy cow, like another Spanish teacher, another high school Spanish teacher is asking, like showing me her skills and asking me to give her feedback. Like 
that shows a level of trust and openness. And then I also, you know, got to see what she was doing. And I think things like that, whether you're saying, will you put your set of eyes on this or say, you know, maybe you don't see a lot of people in person. You could send an email if you knew other Spanish teachers around the area and say, this is what I was thinking, or I've created this piece, but I think you could use something more. Is there anything that, that you would, you know, suggest? Do you have any ideas or, or next steps? And I think you can have really beautiful conversations. Um, and I've also been impressed with Facebook groups. Um, I think sometimes social media can be negative, but recently it has seemed really positive for language learners and language teachers. And so I've seen people posting and saying then in comments, I also have been working on this. Would you like to collaborate? <laughs> I'm like, That's in the morning, awesome. my breakfast, and I'm like, oh, please be nice. Please be nice. And then you see <laughs> Yes. And but somebody That's else awesome. will say, Hey, I would love to, to help with this too. And send a link. Like I'm looking at this. So I think, um, you know, if you're somebody that's shyer, more of a, an introvert, I think that you can still be behind the screen to make those, those first steps and first contacts. And it doesn't hurt. Like you can put that out on Facebook in a group or put it on Twitter, hashtag link chat. And if somebody bites, that's fantastic. You can move on to having a conversation. Um, if nobody does, no harm, nothing bad happens. Uh, if you're super nervous about it, you can press yeah. del delete post. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the fun. potential, right? The potential yeah, for exactly. that. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes you just, just to say, Caroline and Aubrey, will you be on my podcast, please? And talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't know what they'll say and, and you know and then you just get this great conversation and this new you know possibility for collaboration and and getting to know each other so yeah. I just wanted to say thank you so much um for oh coming gosh, and talking it's been just lovely talking with you both and I look forward to collaborating with both of you uh, in the future as well. We'll put in the, the show notes um, a link to your website. So you have some amazing examples. People can dig into the DUU, the do model. Um, you know, so I think that's a wonderful uh, resource for teachers out there. Um, and I just thank you for modeling wonderful energy and positivity and collaboration and friendship. And it's just been lovely being a part of that and chatting with you both. So thank you so much. And we will see you again soon. I'll see you at Nextful for sure. Thank yeah. you, Michelle. Thank, thank you for it. Thank, thank you, Michelle. You.